So hello, my name is Nathan Harvey, and I'm going to walk you through this uh, talk called Intro to Infrastructure as Code, um, which is not what it says on your schedule, and it's not really what this talk is about so much. I think I didn't update the title slide, so you'll have to forgive me there. So we're definitely going to talk about testing your infrastructure code, specifically testing your infrastructure code for a Rails application. Although if what you came here to do is learn a lot about Rails, we're not going to learn a lot about Rails. If you came here to learn a little bit about testing infrastructure code, we're totally going to get you there. So who am I, um, <clears throat> my name is Nathan Harvey. Uh, there are a couple of other things about me there that you can read on the slide. Most important of which uh, is if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do so as long as you misspell my name. So the rule in my house was mom picks the names and dad misspells them. And that was true for me and all of my siblings. Ask me at the break how my other siblings' names are misspelled and I'll happily share that with you. I also found out this morning uh, that I have a work anniversary that I'd like to share with you. And um, can you guess how I found out I have a work anniversary? LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn. I started getting emails from people on LinkedIn saying congratulations on your work anniversary. As it turns out, a year ago, I got my master in DevOps, and I am now a certified DevOp. Uh, and you might think that that's a joke, uh, but you'd be wrong because Patrick Dubois signed my master's in DevOps certificate uh, because last year was the five-year anniversary of DevOps days, and I was there, and those were the badges, and so it's a real thing. I've actually been certified in DevOps uh, as a master for a year now, so you can clap that because that's a kind of an important milestone, right? It's pretty cool. Awesome. Enough about me. How about you? Are you a system administrator? Could you just raise your hand if your answer is yes to these questions that I'm about to ask? Uh, kind of, a little bit, yes, no. How about, how about a developer? Who's a developer in here? Okay, cool. Uh, how many of you are DevOps, like me? I'm a DevOps. Yeah, a little bit. Some people are a little bit of everything. That's cool. Uh, how many of you are business people? Seriously? OK, you all should uh, leave then. Uh, uh, but honestly, uh, you are business people, because if you don't care about the business that your company is in and care about the customers that your business is serving, uh, I think, to me, that's the definition of a business person, is, is someone that does that. And if that is not you, what you should do right now is quit your job and go find another job where you are a business person. Because frankly, I don't care if you're a developer or a sysadmin, if you don't give a shit about what your company does, sorry, uh, then you shouldn't, you shouldn't work there. A uh, couple other quick questions for you, though. Uh, who has experience with infrastructure as code or configuration management? A couple of people, cool. And then more specifically, experience with Chef? Awesome. When I lie about Chef, you're not allowed to say anything. OK, that's our agreement that we'll make in advance. Uh, it's always best when nobody knows what I'm talking about, because then I can sound a lot more confident. Um, how many of you have written automated tests before of any flavor? Awesome. Most of the room. Cool. So I will tell you that I came to, uh, at this problem of infrastructure as code as someone with more of an ops background. But actually, I was kind of a little bit more like this guy up front who every question was kind of, uh, I'm kind of a shitty developer and a bad operator and a, a kind of a, sort of understand what I'm doing when I'm a sysadmin. Um, so that's kind of me. Um, I will try not to curse anymore unless it, uh, unless it makes, brings you joy, in which case there's plenty more where that came from. Uh, so infrastructure as code. Uh, when I say these words, infrastructure as code, I think uh, a bunch of different things. The first thing I think is that with infrastructure as code, what I'm talking about is that you can programmatically provision and configure components within your infrastructure. So I think that that's a pretty good definition of it, though. But then also, I think that with infrastructure as code, what we're implying or stating is that you should treat it like any other code base. But what, is, what does that even mean, to treat it like any other code base? This is the audience participation part. What does that mean? It's in version control, absolutely. Uh, what version control systems do you use? Git. 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 Mercurial. Mercurial. Cool, you can use that. That's fine. Did somebody say subversion? Yeah, cool. Do you use the Git SVN plugin? Uh, Sometimes you should, because any, any, you can use any version control system you like, as long as it starts with GIT. Or Mercurial, that's fine too. But it should be a distributed version control system. That's an important thing. Uh, what, else, but, like, what else does it mean to treat it like any other code base? Of course it's going to be in our version control system. What else? What's that? Yeah, you're going to add automated tests. This is super important. When you're writing code, you should have tests that can validate that code. And you should, uh, you know, as it turns out, we all run tests. 
Even if you've never written a test a day in your life, you all run tests. Sometimes uh, those tests are when you put the code into production and give it to customers. Uh, preferably, we run tests before that happens. Uh, so yeah, you should treat it like any other code base in that it should have automated tests. The other thing that I find is uh, very important and a thing that you have to keep in mind all of the time. When you're writing code, code is a continual experiment. The reason why we have automated tests, the reason why we store code in a version control system is the code that you write today is terrible code when you look back on it 24 months from now. It's the right code for today, no doubt. But in 24 months time or six months time even, you're going to have a better understanding of your requirements. You are going to be better at your craft. So it's going to continually be changing. I, I've written code of one flavor or another for many, many years. And I can tell you that there's not one single piece of code that I look back on from my past and say, yep, that was it. That's the exact code that I needed then and that solved all of the problem and that was it. I don't need to write any more code in my life. Uh, the other thing that's true about infrastructure as code, when you start treating your infrastructure as code, you can reconstruct your business from nothing more than a backup of your data, your source code repositories, and compute resources. And when I say reconstruct your business, as it turns out, businesses are also made of people. You cannot reconstruct any of the people with any of these things. So your business applications, the, the things that run your business that aren't the people. So this is all about automation. <clears throat> um, and just a quick high level overview of Chef. Chef works like this. With Chef, we're going to write these things called recipes. We're gonna store those recipes in cookbooks. We're going to give those cookbooks things like version numbers. We're going to automate the testing of all of our recipes that describe what our infrastructure should look like. We're going to take those uh, artifacts, those cookbooks, which have a version number and exist in our version control system, we're going to publish those to a chef server. And now the nodes within my infrastructure, and a node in that case could be a virtual machine, it could be a cloud instance, it could be a firewall, I don't know what a node is. It could be a bare metal piece of hardware. But the nodes in your infrastructure are going to ask the chef server, what is my policy? What should I look like? Am I a database server? Am I a Rails application server? Am I a Java app? What is that? And it, from there, the chef server will provide the policy or the, the description of the desired state for that node. The node will download that and then make sure that it's following the desired state. What we're going to talk a, a little bit to, about today is the local development workflow that you'll go through as you're describing that infrastructure as code. We're going to use a thing called the chef development kit. Sometimes we call uh, the chef development kit the chef DK. Uh, but I've heard from some people that sometimes when I say Chef DK, what people hear is Chef Decay. And you see the two are not the same. The DK, the development kit, is pretty new, so there's definitely no DK going on there. Uh, so you're going to describe your infrastructure as code. Your code kind of looks like this. If you're in the back of the room, my guess is you can't read what that code looks like. But trust me, it compiled well when I built the PowerPoint, so it's all good. It totally does exactly what I want. Um, and, and brilliant on you for saying, I am in the back of the room and I do want to read that code and I'm going to move forward. Also, these slides are right now available on my GitHub. You can continue to take pictures of the slides. It's cool. It makes me feel good when you do. Um, but uh, also, I'm going to give them all to you at the end. So. Uh, but like I said, feel free to keep snapping the pics. It's cool. Uh, when you write code, you should be able to test your code. And so we're going to look at doing some code as well. I also just want to tell you a little bit about what we're going to do. Uh, or more what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you some slides, which I'm doing now, if you hadn't guessed. But then I'm going to spend most of the time, or uh, half of the time or so, like typing and writing code right before your eyes, and we'll see things work and how they, how they work and how they don't work. I will continue to ask for um, audience participation. I'll be asking you questions and stuff like this. So when it comes to Chef, uh, if we boil all of our Chef code down to its smallest, most uh, important bit, it's these things called resources. We're going to describe resources on our system. So a resource, and this is kind of the hard part about learning any language, chef included, is understanding the vocabulary. So I do want to cover just some basic vocabulary. So when I say a resource, what I mean is a piece of the system and its desired state. What we're capturing in Chef is the desired state of our infrastructure. So let's just look at some examples. That might be a package that should be installed on your system. A package here like the MySQL server, 
with an action of install. That should be there. It might be a service that should be started and set up, configured to run on reboot of the system. So here I have a service called IP tables. I want its end state to be that it is started and that it is enabled on reboot. It could be a file that should be generated whose contents we want to manage. It could be a cron job that gets executed on a regular basis. Uh, it could be a user that we want to manage. It could be a DSC resource. Who's heard of DSC before? So there's no Windows admins in the room? No? Okay. Well, when, the, when, when you decide that what you want to be as a business person, so you need to quit your job and you get hired at a place that has Windows infrastructure, the first thing you need to learn there is PowerShell and DSC. DSC is uh, a Microsoft Windows component. It stands for Desired State Configuration. It's super cool if you're managing Windows and definitely not going to help you if you're managing Linux. Um, uh, registry keys. Uh, I can just rewind, repeat, say all those same things again. Okay, so resources are a piece of the system and their desired state. Chef comes with a bunch of built-in resources. You can read the docs to find out all about those resources. Let's be honest, you're not going to read the docs because why would you read the docs? Like nobody ever does that. That's why you come to conferences so you don't have to read the docs. You can just get enough learning to get you going. Resources follow what I call a test and repair model. The test and repair model looks like this. So when Chef encounters this code, package vim, it will ask, it will inspect the system, is the package already installed? If that package is installed, it will do nothing. So Chef is done with that particular bit of code. If that code is, or that package is not installed, in other words, the system is not at its desired state, Chef will install it. And that's what I call the repair phase. So it's going to test, are we meeting the desired state? If not, I'm going to bring the system in line with the desired state. What questions can I answer for you so far? So far, so good, huh? All right. We're all feeling like chef experts, ready to go. Let's go manage our infrastructure. Uh, so there are a bunch of resources that come with Chef, and then you can write your own custom resources also, which is a pretty cool feature uh, because it's, it's, you know, you're writing code, so you can extend that code as well. We're going to take our resources and put them together in a collection. That collection is really a file that's called a recipe. So we'll take all of the resources that are required for our specific thing, we'll put them into a recipe, and then that recipe will live within a cookbook. So let's talk about how do we actually write that in a test-driven fashion? How do we actually test out this code? So of course, there's the question of why do you want to test your code? Um, who do I need to convince that testing your code is an important thing to do? Anyone? It's OK to be the one person that's like, yeah, YOLO. I just do it all in prod. <laughs> it's good. No, nobody's like that? Man, you all are too much on the professionals. That's no fun. OK, so. Um, who knows the difference between a unit test and an integration test? Okay, and who doesn't care about the difference between a unit test and an integration test? <laughs> like you shouldn't, I don't. Uh, certainly not if you're just getting started. I, I, and those of you that do are like, no, wait, I know the difference, so of course I should care about it. It's a thing that I know. I agree, at some point you should know it, but if what you're doing is just getting started, you shouldn't care about that. And when I just get started with chef testing, uh, what I like to think about are four questions. And these are the four questions that I want my tests to answer. Did the chef client complete successfully? So there were a couple of people who raised their hand and said, yes, I've done some chef before. Uh, of, of those of you who raised your hand, and I'll remember exactly who it was, um, how many of you have written, like every recipe that you wrote and then executed with the chef client worked without an, any error the first time always? Right, see, no, but no one is raising their hand. And how many of you, like, of those people, if what you did was wrote a recipe and then ran the chef client and it worked without throwing an error, like, that's a pretty happy moment, right? That feels pretty good. You don't necessarily know if the system is configured properly, but what you do know is your code didn't blow anything up. So if we could automate that testing, that would be good. Uh, but of course, that doesn't tell us, is the system configured the way we want? So how do we test that? So that's the next question that we should ask. Did the recipe put the node in the desired state? And if we can write an automated test for that, now we have even more confidence. And we can do all of that locally before we even publish anything or try to run it in production. And then other questions like, are the resources properly defined? And does this code style, fo style our follow guide? Which is just another way of saying follow our style guide and also to make sure that you're awake and listening so that you can laugh at me when I say the words in the wrong order, which you should totally do. 
Okay, so we're gonna answer at least two out of the four questions and I'm gonna show you some code and, and maybe at the end we'll have some time for uh, more fun stuff. But what we're gonna do is a pretty simple scenario. Um, we're gonna just deploy a Rails application. So I'm gonna go from a, a virtual machine that is just a baseline Ubuntu box. I'm gonna run some Chef on that box and at the end we're going to have a fully deployed and working Rails application. How many of you are Rails developers or have, have done some Rails development before? And did you come to this session because it was Rails or because you're interested in Chef? You shouldn't answer that question because, um, I mean, you can answer that question, but I, I, I didn't ask you a yes or no. So like raise your right hand if one of the answers and raise your left hand if the other. Awesome, I like to see two hands up. Yeah, raise the roof, that's good. Okay, so, uh, so here's what we're gonna do. Uh, it's a simple thing, we're gonna have some time to work through some of the code. I'm going to give you all of the code when we're done. So even the code we don't get to work through, you get to have. It's my gift to you. You're welcome. It's awesome. Okay, so uh, from maybe from this point forward, I'm just gonna switch over to uh, uh, like writing code. I hope that's okay. So, um, wow, that's like super big. I think maybe we can make that a little different. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, well, it's still pretty big. All right, I'm gonna just... Okay, so uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is, this is a true cooking show. I'm gonna put something in the oven so that when we're done, I can pull that thing out of the oven and we can say, ta-da, look how delicious this is. Uh, so I'm just gonna run a little command here. You shouldn't pay any attention to this. That command is gonna be kitchen converge. Uh, and I'm just gonna let that run. So that's gonna go off and run. And in the meantime, I'm gonna do this crazy thing where I have another shell prompt at the bottom. I'm gonna flip these two windows so that we just see the little thing running. Um, and now the big thing is up. So see the little things running down there now? I might have lost you. I've, I've confused myself already. So here we are here. Okay, so uh, let's create this thing where we can build our Rails application. The first thing I'm going to do is this amazing thing. Watch this command and then uh, watch, watch what I'm gonna type. Take ATO. What does that mean? What is that gonna do? Who's run the take command before? Raise your hand if you've ever executed take from the command line. All right, how many of you run Z shell? Okay, and with the oh my ZSH plugin? Yeah, of course, because why would you run Z shell any other way? Watch what happens here. Take ATO, Oh, you see what it did? It created the directory and then it moved me into the directory. So it did a make dir and a cd all in one command for me. Now, if you're using Z shell and oh my ZSH and you learned that, like you just got your money's worth, boom, you're done. Like it doesn't matter what else I say today, you have just won. Uh, so, but that's not what we're here. We're not here to learn crazy shell tricks, are we? We're here to learn about testing your infrastructure code and we're definitely not here to have any fun. So I should stop with making you laugh. Uh, so the thing I wanna do when I'm, uh, when I'm creating stuff with Chef, I wanna put all of my code into a repository because we talked about putting it into a version control repository. So Chef has this command line tool, it's called Chef. If I run Chef dash dash version, we'll see that I'm running locally the 0.8.0 .0 version of the Chef development kit. Uh, this is not the latest version and I intentionally have not used the latest version. 0.8.0 .0 is just a week older than the latest version, so I know this will work. I also know that 0.9.0, .0, we we'd have to change the way I teach. And, I don't wanna change the way I teach. I, f I feel like I do an okay job. So I'm just gonna clear that off. And then what I'm gonna use, uh, so the chef command has this cool thing where it can generate things. So I'm gonna chef generate a repo for all of my um, chef code. And I'm just gonna call that the chef dash repo. Ooh, I should, uh, so often when I talk and type, I make typos and you should laugh at me when I do. That's, that's the uh, thing that we have here. So here's the thing. Uh, it just used Chef to generate a, a, a directory here called uh, the Chef repo. And if I just look at that really quick, we can see that there's a bunch of stuff here, uh, including like a roles directory and an environments directory. There's a cookbooks directory, a license, a, all, all kinds of stuff. So that was just created for me. But what I wanna do, uh, I wanna run my Rails application or I wanna build a thing for my Rails application. So the first thing that we know about a Rails application is you access it how? How do you access a Rails app? Through a, through a web browser, right? So we might need a web server that sits on my server. So which web server do you think we should install? Come on, somebody gave a talk here at least. Uh, nah. 
Uh, Nginx, that would be a great web server to install. It's the best web server out there. Uh, it's not what we're going to use, though. Uh, so your answer was correct, but it's not what I'm going to do. So I'm going to use Chef now. Uh, actually, let me just CD into the Chef repo. So I'm in the right place here. Uh, what I should do is git init this directory, and then git add all the stuff, and then git commit uh, dash m the ooh, initial repo. All right, now I feel better because um, I'm working in a repository and it's clean. So what I want to do is I want to create a cookbook to manage Apache for me. So I want to define the desired state of Apache. So Chef has that generate command that I'm going to use again. And I'm going to generate this time a cookbook. And I want to put that cookbook in the cookbooks directory. And I want to call that cookbook Apache. So it looks like this. And I'm going to run that. How many of you have used Rails generators before? Yeah, all the people that said they were Rails developers. Uh, so the chef generate command is similar to using Rails scaffolds, right, to do the Rails generators. There's a big difference, though. Uh, I've just created that scaffold, and I'm not going to delete all the files next. <laughs> That's the difference between the chef generate command and the Rails generate command. Uh, but what I should do, of course, is just go ahead and do like a git add cookbooks Apache, and then uh, git commit that. Uh, I should, you know, type the right thing. All right, and then let me just CD into that cookbooks Apache, and let me just show you what's here. Okay, so there were uh, a bunch of files and directories. So uh, first, what I just did was create a cookbook. A cookbook is essentially a known structure on your file system. And it has uh, some default files and some files that we actually care about and some directories. So there's a readme, that's good. You should write what you're gonna do in your readme. It has a metadata. We said that our cookbooks should have versions associated with them, version numbers associated with them. We store that in the metadata. There's a directory for recipes. There's a directory for spec tests. There's a directory for test tests uh, and some other stuff there. So if I just jump back to the slides for a second, I'm going to skip through a bunch of them because we did all of these things. But I want to make sure that. Uh, so the first question we're going to ask ourselves is, if we run the Chef client over our recipe, will it complete successfully? Well, in order to do that, we need to have a place to store that recipe that, can have, that has the Chef client and can actually execute that recipe. So as it turns out, I'm running and working locally on a Mac. How many of you have Macs in production? Ah, uh, 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 everyone's like, I know this. I, oh, wait, no, not in production. Uh, definitely not in production. I totally, uh, I, I have managed infrastructure where we had Mac Minis in the data center. That was pretty awesome. Uh, I don't work there anymore, maybe because I put Mac Minis in the data center, but, but maybe not. So what, we need something that's running the same operating system as production. How many of you run Ubuntu in production? How many of you can foresee a time in your future where maybe you would run Ubuntu in production? All right, cool, cool. So that's like everyone in the room, it seems. Um, either that or your arm is just getting tired, which is cool. So we're going we're gonna to use Ubuntu, but it doesn't really matter that we're using Ubuntu. What we're going to use is this tool called Test Kitchen. Test Kitchen is a little testing harness for us that will allow us to spin up applications, throw stuff onto them, and uh, test them out. I should move more quickly. So. What I'm going to do is just jump back right into the code. Is that okay with you guys? With y'all? I shouldn't say you guys. That's so super wrong of me to say. I'm sorry I said that. Uh, so in here I have this file that's called kitchen.yaml. Kitchen.yaml is what we use to describe our test kitchen. So let me just walk you through this. First you have a driver. What test kitchen is, let me step back. What test kitchen is going to do is spin up virtual machines for me take my chef code, put it onto those virtual machines, and execute my chef code. And then we can write automated tests about that. So the first question you have, uh, I hear it now. Nathan, you said it's going to spin up virtual machines. Where is it going to spin up those virtual machines? Well, the answer is it depends. It depends on the driver. So I'm going to use this driver here named Vagrant. How many of you have heard of Vagrant before? Awesome. If you want to learn more about Vagrant, there's a talk going on right now on the other side of the hall where you can learn about using Vagrant. 
What I suggest you do and prefer that you do is stay here and I'll tell you a little bit about Vagrant. But essentially, uh, it helps you spin up virtual machines locally. There's way more to it than that, but that's all we're gonna say today. Once it spins up that virtual machine, it's gonna configure that virtual machine with a provisioner. So we're gonna use this thing called Chef Zero. Chef Zero is essentially the Chef client. And, and those of you that are like, yeah, you said essentially, but what's the difference? Well, you can ask me at the break or as we're walking to the next end of the hall. And then platforms, so which operating systems should I spin up? Up as my um, virtual machines. I'm just going to use Ubuntu 12 because you know I'm in production and I haven't upgraded yet and I'm going to comment out this CentOS one just for the sake of time. So we're going to write one little thing that's going to launch Ubuntu. And then finally you have your suites. A suite is what are the recipes that you're going to execute in that virtual machine. So I'm going to run the default recipe from the Apache cookbook. And so I'm just going to write and quit that and then I'm going to run this command kitchen list and what kitchen list will show me is that I have uh, a very small buffer and it can't show all the things on a line that makes it look pretty but essentially I have one instance called default Ubuntu 1204 the driver is going to be vagrant the provisioner is going to be chef zero uh, and then some other things so the first thing that I can do is I want to ask the question if I put this recipe that I just wrote onto that node and execute the chef client, will it work successfully? And the way that I'm gonna answer that question is I'm gonna run this command, kitchen converge. And you, you might remember this from earlier, I ran that command earlier down there on that other window at the bottom. We'll come back to that in a minute. So what does kitchen converge do? Let's look at the slides while that runs in the background. And also someone can log into my box and make sure it works properly and fix it if it doesn't. So when I go back to the code, it'll, it'll just look like magic because this is truly a cooking show. Um, let's see, so we did a kitchen list. Okay, so the first thing that kitchen converge will actually do is behind the scenes it will run this command called kitchen create. What kitchen create will do is create a little test kitchen, a little virtual machine on my workstation. So my workstation is the big orange box. It's my Mac that's sitting right here in front of me. And then the test kitchen is going to be an Ubuntu VM in that little blue box up there. Uh, I could then kitchen log in, although I don't know if that's done, it's still not done. So I can't actually kitchen log in yet. You're gonna trust me because the slide says I could write kitchen log in. And what that would do is it would make an SSH connection from my local machine. It would SSH into that test kitchen box. And we'd see that I'm logged in there as the vagrant user on this default Ubuntu thing. So this tells me that I've created the environment but then how do I actually test my chef code? The next step is actually to converge the environment. And so we exit out from having logged in, then we run the kitchen converge command. And you may have noticed if you were paying attention that I didn't run kitchen create, I just ran kitchen converge. Kitchen converge is smart enough to say if the kitchen doesn't exist, I should create the kitchen first and then converge it. So what does kitchen converge do? It, it will install chef, it will upload the cookbook that we've written, and then it will apply the run list. So our run list is the default Apache cookbook. So it's going to take that recipe, put it onto my test kitchen, and execute chef client across that. And so now we can test, uh, did the chef client run complete successfully? And if we come back over here, Indeed it did, so it is finished converging. The kitchen is finished. It took one minute and six seconds for me to take, create a virtual machine, spin up that virtual machine, put my chef code onto it, and execute the chef client across that code. So that's pretty cool, right? So now I have this machine, this test kitchen here, that I could actually kitchen log in and go into. And what's the name of our cookbook here? Do you remember? Yeah, it's called the Apache cookbook. So you'd expect that it might do what? Hopefully install Apache. Hopefully install Apache. And if it installed Apache, it might, it might be running. So maybe we could check that. I could do like a W get, right? And I could look for local host. And let's see. Oh, man, it certainly isn't running. The connection's refused. Huh. That kind of stinks. I wonder why that is. Uh, well, let's just write some tests to make sure that what we don't have to do is log in and like bang on the box and see if it's actually working or not. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm actually going to open this up in a, in a text editor locally. Um, so I'm going to use this text editor called Atom. You guys from, are you all familiar with Atom? Yep. Anybody use Sublime Text? That's also cool. Or Vim? Or how do you know an Emacs user? They'll tell you, that's exactly right. You got it, you got it, that's good. I think you've seen this show before. Okay, so I'm gonna just go over here to this uh, crazy deep thing here. So I'm in my recipe, my Apache cookbook, 
Uh, in the test directory, there's an integration subdirectory with a default and then server spec. And then there's this default spec thing. So some of you have written Rails before, so you've probably written tests before using RSpec. This is going to look very familiar to you. So server spec is a library that we're going to use to test our infrastructure code. Server spec is basically a, uh, special matchers that sit on top of RSpec. It's going to work all the same. The thing I like to do first, though, when I'm testing something out is just make sure that my test framework is all configured properly. So I'm going to write uh, the test that you should always write. The first test you should ever write is you should assert that it is uh, awesome. And what you should do is you should expect true dot to equal true. That's a good test, right? We're going to assert that true is true. As an operations person, I know that all you developers, this is all your tests ever do. And you say, look, my tests are green, Nathan. You can put it in production. It's totally fine. Uh, so uh, crazy enough, like that does happen. Uh, so I can verify that, again, using kitchen. I can run this command here called kitchen verify. And what kitchen verify is going to do is it's going to install the server spec library in that running VM. And then it's going to execute all of my server spec tests. So it's going to take a second here to install that. That's going to run. Uh, and then we're going to see the output is that, uh, here we go. In fact, uh, right, scroll up like not that, like that. That, in fact, Apache is awesome. See, my tests are green. We're ready to go to production, right? Yay, that's awesome, except it's totally not awesome. So let's go back to our code. So what were some things that you th said maybe we could test while we're here? What's that? Request. We could test the request. So it uh, responds to an HTTP request. OK, what, give me one other. We'll do two, just because I'm feeling, I'm feeling fun. Like, yeah, we can see that it is running. Cool. So uh, the other thing I like to do when I'm writing my test is just write my it statements and then rerun that kitchen verify. Because I want to make sure that the output looks right. Because as it turns out, the output from my server spec tests or from any of my tests, the output is for the humans. It's not for the computers. So if I can read this and say Apache default is awesome, it responds to an HTTP request and is running, like all of that feels like pretty good English. You know, it's good enough that if, I, if you read that and it failed, you would understand why. So also, it's fun to see that if you just do the it statements without any description, like anything in the do and end block, it just implements those tests as pending for you, which also fun to see in a way that to tell you this is what I have to test for and then eventually what I have to actually implement. So it responds to an HTTP request. Let's go ahead and write that one. So we're going to have a do and an end block. And I'm going to expect, this one is hard for me to write, so you're going to have to bear with me. I'm going to expect a thing. Uh, and I want it uh, to equal 0. You're going to be like, well, what is, what is that thing? It's going to be a command. And I want its uh, exit status to equal 0. See why well, I have to type it like this? Because there's too many parens in this. Because, you know, uh, curl, nope, wget, http, local host. OK, so I expect that when I execute this command, its exit status will equal 0. What questions do you have about that? 0 just means success. You know why? Because sysadmins are crazy people. So if, it, if the number is 0, that means all things are good, right? None of these stupid languages where true and 1 are the same. Like true, 1, these sound like positive things. No, 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 no. 0. 0 is what we're looking for because we're sysadmins. That's how we roll. OK, so and then is running. Let's do another test here really quick. So expect. This one's a little bit easier for me to type, uh, except it's not at all. <laughs> easier to type, harder to spell. I expect the service uh, named something. What's the service name here? Anyone know? Uh, HTTPD is a good guess, and it's wrong. We're, we're on Ubuntu. What's the service name? HTTP 24, also a good guess, also wrong. Anyone else? Almost, almost there. 
Apache 2, you got it, you got it. Because who would want just straight up Apache? You want Apache 2, it's clearly better. It's like twice as good. Um, but seriously, why is it HTTPD on CentOS and Apache 2 over here? Like, anyone know? I'll tell you why while I type. Um, the reason that, it, that they're different like that is so that everyone in this room can stay employed because you know, you know that it's HTTPD on CentOS and you know that it's Apache 2 on Ubuntu and your boss doesn't know that because that person is a manager and that's, that's the value you bring to your organization. That's all a lie, that's all a lie. All right, so I expect the service to be running. Does that sound better? Uh, so look, that's pretty easy to write those, those tests, especially if you're a Rails developer, this should feel, feel super comfortable. If what you are is brand new to testing, this feels like, whoa, and you're right, but I will help you get there, except I can't do it in 40 minutes. I can just show you how awesome it is in 40 minutes. So let's go ahead and run this kitchen verify back again over here. Kitchen verify, what's gonna happen when I verify this? It's totally gonna fail because the wget failed before and the service is not running. And so now Chef is stupid. Like why isn't it doing anything that I asked it to do? So if I scroll back, sure enough, I have three examples, two failures. Um, but I think the first thing that passes is a lie. It says Apache is awesome. Clearly that's not the case because uh, it's not responding and it's not actually running. So now the next thing that we should do is we should actually, like why isn't it working? Tell me why. We didn't write the recipe. All we did was write the test. We should actually go back and write the recipe. We should tell it what is its desired state. So I'm gonna go over here into the recipe directory. There's a default thing. And what you see here is a bunch of comments. So that sucks. Uh, we should write some things here. So first, uh, if you wanted Apache to be on that machine, uh, what would you do? What would you do? You should start the service. Okay, so let's say service uh, Apache 2. And then Chef has these things, we call it an action. It's a stupid word, but that's the word we have. Uh, and we want it to be started. Uh, so that's the thing. All right, so now let's give this a go. So what if we do a kitchen converge here? Let's see what happens. So now it should encounter that thing that says service Apache 2 start, start the, oh man, what's going on? Did I misspell it? I didn't misspell it. Nice guess, but it wasn't my fault this time. Uh, so why didn't it start the service? Anyone have a guess? Not installed. Oh, it's not installed. You didn't say misspelled, you said not installed. I can't hear very well. You should use a mic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if I do package Apache 2, action, installed. Anyone know why I put that in front of the service thing? Any guesses? You can't start the service if the thing isn't installed. And as it turns out, the way Chef works, when it comes to your recipe files, it will execute the resources in the order in which they're listed. So first it will install the package, and then it will attempt to start the service. If we had kept it service first, what happens when Chef encounters a resource it, doesn't, it can't use, it will just blow up right away. So it would never get to the package uh, part. So package Apache 2 install, service Apache 2 start, Let's go ahead and run our kitchen converge and see what happens. And uh, this is the part where the live demo makes me sweat a little bit. We're gonna see if it actually actually works because there's totally a case in which it won't like this case that we're in right now. Uh, so that's cool, but I know, I know how to fix it. I know exactly how to fix it. What I would do is show you the error message. Whoa, it's time to do something else. I'm late, I'm totally late for meetings. I would show you how to, uh, like the error message, but it, for the sake of time, because we're out of it, I'm just gonna fix it with a little execute resource. Uh, execute is a way for Chef to just uh, do a thing, execute a thing. And what we need to run is an apt get update. Ooh. All right. So uh, the reasons why, man, I don't know. But um, you know, we can totally talk about that. But that's going to make this thing work. And the, the thing that I want is a working demo when, when we leave here today. And the thing I'm going to give you all is all of the working code. And what we're going to have here, so there are two of three resources updated. So it installed the service. It started it. Anyone have a guess as to why two of three resources were updated? That seems odd, right? I have three resources. Which three resources do I have? Let's just look again at that code. I have an execute resource, a package resource, and a service resource. 
So here's the thing, Ubuntu's crazy. When you install the package, it also starts the service for you because that's what you want to do. Anytime you install a thing, you clearly want to start the thing, except when you don't. Uh, so it, that's just how Ubuntu works. And those of you that were like, it's called HTTPD, yeah, it is. It's crazy. It's crazy that they do this, but it's, it's, how, it's how they do. I'm totally out of time now, so, uh, I'm, but I'm not done. You're not excused yet. <laughs> so we should now run our kitchen verify to make sure that that passes. And what's going to happen here is, sure enough, it's going to pass. We have three examples with zero failures. And we can see that Apache is awesome. It's responding to an HTTP request and is running. What do you think? <laughs> Woo! And, and we did that in a test-driven fashion. But I want to I just show you two, quickly two things. The first thing that we should do uh, is we should kitchen destroy. Uh, that's going to destroy that virtual machine. It's gone now, because I want to start from fresh. Because I just made a bunch of changes and ran Converge a bunch of times. I want to make sure that if this was a brand new machine, it would work. So now I'm just going to run Kitchen Verify. Kitchen Verify is going to be smart enough to create, Converge, Verify for me. And then it's going to tell me the results. Hopefully the results are good. While that's running, I'm just going to switch these two screens around again. So now we can come back up here and see what we saw. This is the thing that I ran at the very beginning. I ran a Kitchen Converge. And you can see here that it converged uh, 40 of 58 resources. And the other thing that it did is I can now open, uh, let me do this so you can see what I'm typing. Uh, open local, local host at, uh, I think I put it at port 8080. We'll find out in just a second. Uh, waiting for local host. Look at that, listing widgets. This is a Rails app. We can create a new widget. New widget, I'm gonna call it uh, ATO. I'm gonna give it a part number uh, of one and then I can create the widget and then I can go back and look at that, it's a, it's a working Rails app. It's beautiful, it's a little crud thing. I can show, edit, destroy. <coughs> I can cough really loud into the mic. Uh, I can also uh, just open this up really quick and show you what we did. So my kitchen YAML looks kind of like this. It's vagrant, it's doing some for port forwarding. So on the virtual machine, port 80, goes to 8080 on my local machine. And it's running this big long recipe here called widget world application default, which creates a database, installs the Rails app, gets everything all configured for us. And then just the final thing that we need to do here before I truly excuse you, is see that when I start from fresh, three examples are passing, I have zero failures. What do you think? All right, you have negative two minutes and 40 seconds to ask me any questions that you have. All right, but honestly, if you do want to ask me questions, so first, thank you so much for coming. All of this is on my GitHub right now, uh, which is github.com slash Nathan Harvey. And if you do have questions, walk with me to the far end of the hall where I'm going to give my next talk. You can ask me questions on the way so we're clear because the next talk has nothing to do with this. Uh, also, you can just troll me with questions about this talk in the next talk if you prefer. It would be fine with me. Everyone else would be confused. Thanks very much.